watching welcome welcome to the show today okay okay please say hello to me i can see you're watching uh, i'm on a platform that if you don't not say hello i wouldn't be able to say who is watching and i want to acknowledge you so please say hi to me uh i'm excited to be here and today i want to start with this question do you know anyone who battles or struggle with their alcohol consumption. Maybe they don't even know that they have the, the problem, but you from the inside think that this is problematic and you, they haven't been able to do something about it. Do you know one person, a colleague, a family member, a friend, a sibling? If you know one person, just say yes, just say yes or why or something. Do you know someone? struggling with alcohol issues or are you the one struggling with controlling how much alcohol you consume is it beer is it wine what whatever it is is it you if you know one person please just say okay oh yeah you see i only see uh see oh lara lara welcome uh oh my sister from Accurate, thank you so much uh i can president right there holy shot there are so many people turning in thank you for coming do you know one person if you do know one person just one person please say yes okay and i'm saying yes here yes here yes okay yes you do and i do too on a personal level on a personal level i know people battling, struggling with getting over addiction. And let me tell you something. There's something we all have been getting wrong. And I will tell you just before I log off. So please hold on. Stay with me. Let's take this thing um, a step at a time. I want to first say that I'm focusing on our military members today. This topic, we're still going to get to it sometimes next year and we'll go into it in full details, but this information will help all of us. Now, when we see, if you've, if you've seen a military uh, member, a veteran, someone who is still active in duty, and you say, thank you for your service, what are you really thanking them for? Let me know. Is it their sacrifice? Is it the time away? Is it their courage? What are you saying? That service, what do you have in mind? If you're a civilian, you've seen somebody in uniform before and say, oh, thank you for your service, regardless of the country that you're in. What is that service that you're thanking them for? Let me know. Thank you for your service. Last week, or anyway, recently, one of my patients is a veteran and he he was just saying, it's like everything is gone. He, he was deployed and he came back and it's like, he said, my life has not been the same again. And he, even with me, he was just literally frustrated. And it took empathy. It took beyond knowing what medication to prescribe or knowing what diagnosis to put on his phone or knowing anything to really be able to connect with him. But you know what brought him in? It was his wife who said, you, we have to try this again. Because he had tried several times to really get over this problem, the alcohol problem, you know, the PTSD, the post-traumatic stress disorder. He's been trying 
he, he kept on saying this demon I, I just can't fight this demon away it, it, it keeps coming back and it is a lot okay dj as this dj as this you're thanking them for their courage their courage of just being in the military yes you know that's what we we see most times and we say a lot of times and i agree with you it takes a lot of courage to even say hey i want to go into the military what it's like you're like okay i'm ready for i'm ready to die that's what you're saying like i'm literally ready to lay my life down for my country but here is what I've, uh, i'm coming to realize that we should really have at the back of our mind when we say thank you for your service particularly those who have been deployed once or twice or multiple times is that when they go to combat zone and they come back they do not come back the same military people who are being deployed whenever they come back they are not coming back as the same person that's gone to the combat zone it is a lot of work it is a lot of sacrifice it, there's some videos I do not. It, people send a lot of videos on WhatsApp or you know Facebook, YouTube. There's some video. If I see a video going viral and you know they put um, warning, sensitive view, I do not open them because once you see something, you cannot unsee that thing. You cannot say, okay, I saw it and I'm just not. I didn't see it again. It's just like when you hear something, you cannot say, I did not hear that again. I said, maybe you have amnesia or, you know, dementia or, you know, something going on. You can't unsee and you can't unhear anything that, that you've been exposed to. But they go out there to war. They go out there and at that time, it is fight or die. At that time, it is stay together with your team or we lose all of you. And at that time, it is, they are hyper a lot. They are hyper vigilant. They are looking out for the enemies. They are shooting, doing everything they need to do, either to protect themselves or to protect their team members. And it is a lot of exposure to danger. And guess what? These things happen by the time they're coming back. They lose so much. From losing a teammate, a friend on the battlefield to some of them lose their body parts. Some of them, they lose their, they lose that innocence of never being exposed to war. They lose that innocence, it's gone. They don't have it again. So now they've seen people die. Now they've seen a lot of stuff. They're blood all around them and they're coming back home and they, it's not like they're coming back home to just unleash all this thing on, on their family members. They have to keep a lot of those things to themselves. And I, like I heard when we had uh, Amy and Chip, Chip Ladipo, and they told us that a lot of training they still have to do when they come back. So that military person you're saying, thank you for your service. That service that we sum up in courage to join the military is way beyond that. I think it should really be thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for the sacrifices. Because I think putting it as services, it, it, it undermines what they have to give to be in the military or to call themselves a veteran. So now they lose a lot of things coming back. When they get back, when they return, a lot of times they've lost something too. They come back to losses. Some of them come back to a, 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 a loved one uh, having passed away. Some of them, they had lost the, 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 the presence during their children's milestone, a, a child's wedding, a child's first word, the child's first steps. So many things that they lose even when they come back. Some of them, they're coming back with a body part loss. And some of them, now that they're coming, they don't have that peace. They don't have that, you know, sense of they're dealing with intrusive thoughts. They're dealing with flashbacks. They're dealing with the fear. They're dealing with hypervigilance. They're dealing with, um, um, you know, the hyper arousal. They're dealing with their, their minds not being the same anymore. So when they come, even sometimes they're, 
loved one is not there for them anymore. The wife is there or they have to deal with infidelity or they have to deal with um, financial problem. Maybe while they're gone, their husband or their, their wife had, you know, not managed money well, or maybe they, and everything is just not the same anymore to keep, to, to keep it short. Now, what happened? Some of them would go ahead to have PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder. Some of them have PTS, they have the stress. It is not all veteran, it is not all military people that go ahead to have the disorder. But there's none of them that does not have to deal with that stress. There's none of them that does not have to deal with what they've seen. But now let's zoom in to those who are dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder. Mind you, a lot of them have this diagnosis, they have this issue going on, but they're never even diagnosed. They are not even seeking treatment. We'll go to reasons why they're not seeking treatment another time. Some of them are not seeking treatment, so they don't know. So the problem is now their family dealing with all that. And while we're talking about those with PTSD, what would they do? Instead of seeking treatment, some of them want to mask it. They want to escape from the trauma and the trouble. They want to escape from that pain, the sense of loss of their loved one, the sense of loss of their friend. You know, some of them, their friends literally just give, say the last words in their presence or in their hands. And they want to just escape from that trauma, from the trouble. And they decide to turn to something that can help. Because while they're back, the endorphin is, is, is going down. And they need it. They need that endorphin to deal with the pain and all those things they're going through. But it's not there. But when they take alcohol, when they take it, it comes back and it helps them at that time. In the moment, it takes the pain away. In the moment, their alcohol is there to just numb the pain. In the moment, the alcohol is there to just rescue them. It's like in the moment, they're like, you're my body. This is my body right here, and we're going to do this together. We got this. Now, let's escape into the world of unknown. Some of them take it to forget. Some of them take it to stop the intrusive thoughts. Some of them take it just maybe, maybe if they take more of this thing, they're going to be able to sleep for one hour. Some of them take it that maybe, maybe they will just be able to forget that their wife or their girlfriend or their boyfriend or or their loved one is not there anymore. Let's just go into the world of unknown with alcohol. But guess what happens? After taking this one, then it's not enough. It's This is okay for today, but tomorrow, oh, it gets to the point that my tolerance is now building for it, and I'll need more. I need to fill this up. I was like, where is my bottle of alcohol? Where is it? Where is it? Then they go look for it. They get more. They fill the glass. And then the one they're taking is not even enough. And then they can go ahead and even start mixing it. Oh, maybe when I mix this, I'm going to be able to get more. And they take it. And this becomes their best friend. And they escape. But here's the problem. It doesn't solve the problem permanently. Another problem is that it just builds up. I'm needing more every time. So every little time that I have, every little money that I have, every little moment that I have, I go to my friend that makes me forget my pain. And I'm needing more and more. And then when it gets to a point, my alcohol takes control and I cannot control it anymore. It takes all the control. Everything that I do, everything that I'm saying depends on having my friend right there beside me. Alcohol takes control. And guess what happens when it takes control? It leads to more trouble. More trouble. And this trouble are divided into three. The trouble, dividing it into three, it affects the person. That individual now have to deal with what? They have to deal with their brain. The way their brain, their brain functions, the way their brain communicates, that's, it's now different. The connection, the way their, their, their neurons, the way they, they communicate within themselves is now affected, is now being impacted 
the nerves are not communicating the right way anymore. Everything is going away, unfortunately. And their brain starts changing. The, it starts looking different. Start working different. And when something happens to the brain, what do we have? We have the mood being affected. We have the feelings. We have the thought process, their judgment. Everything is now being affected to the point that it starts causing trouble in their relationships their relationship with their family, with their spouse, with their wife. A lot of intimate uh, uh, partner violence is related to alcohol. When we have this alcohol, this level of alcohol consumption among our military people, those who have access to weapons, those who are hypervigilant, they have PTSD going on, and they're now under the influence of this thing. They're now under the influence of this thing that takes all the control and tell them what to do or, or what not to do. They can't control it. So it exposes their family to trouble. It exposes their family to violence. It exposes themselves even to violence. And what happens to their body? The brain is affected. I told you, communication is going away. Their heart is affected. The muscles of the heart will start getting will start having trouble, the expansion, they take it this time, they put so much load on the, on, on the, the muscles, we start having issues. It gets to their having blood pressure, blood pressure can lead to stroke, and then they become even more liability with their health. Their health becomes, their, their, their health becomes illness. And then we have the liver, they have to stop, start having things like liver cirrhosis, hepatitis, liver, all those things, it starts happening. The, their pancreas, a lot of people taking alcohol, they don't know like, oh, we didn't even have diabetes in my family. Look at me now, I'm diabetic. Oh, because you're taking so much alcohol, your, your effect, it's affecting your pancreas, your insulin, your insulin production and everything already. You're having issues with that. And then they're exposed to cancer. It's carcinogenic, you know? And they take this thing as much as they need to numb the pain or to escape it. Remember what I said they have to go through. Now, put yourself in the position of a veteran or put yourself in a position of someone who had gone to war. How much do you think you can tolerate? How do you think you can cope? We're not all the same. We are not all the same. Not everyone can cope the same way. Not everyone can go ahead to have their lives going on the same way. Some people are just not that lucky to not have post-traumatic stress disorder. And they have to deal with it. So when they turn to their friend alcohol or to any other substance, then we start having issues. But guess what? Other than their family members, other than themselves and their bodies, their, their body parts that they're affecting, do you know they also in, they also negatively affect strangers? The World Health Organization puts there that up to about 3 million deaths are associated globally. About 3 million deaths are associated to alcohol. And in, with alcohol, 40% of those who are going for treatment, at least in the US, 40% of those who are going for treatment for substance misuse disorder or substance use disorder, they are veterans. So the, the, the proportion or the prevalence of the, the proportion of the people that are being treated for substance disorder is higher among the military than civilian. But we all know why the number is that way. They have to sacrifice a lot. So when alcohol becomes their friend and it takes control and it exposes them to their ill health, family troubles, and even when they start, when this their life patterns start impacting the lives of strangers, not even in their own lifetime, even when they're gone, because the children that are seeing this violence being perpetrated in the house, they are ex they would also have child that is child childhood trauma. The wife, the spouse that is being beaten every time, that is being uh, 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 violated or exposed to domestic violence every time because of alcohol. Guess what? She is also prone to complex uh, post traumatic disorder. Because for a very long time, if you have to endure traumatic events for a sustained long time, you are exposed to it for a long time, you are at a risk of develop, developing complex post-traumatic stress disorder. It's complex. 
and they start having dissociation and they start having problem even long after this man is out of their life or they're out of his life. For the rest of their life, people in their own generation and generations to come, the impact of alcohol use disorder remains. And the reason I'm stressing all this is I want us to follow that part to what I want to ultimately tell us today. And that is, as all those things that we're saying, as it's impacting them negatively, as it's affecting their relationship and exposing all the loved ones in their lives to trouble, stress, financial tussle, shame, and all this trouble that they're having to go through, even homelessness. You know, a lot of, a lot of veterans are homeless. To, 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 to cancer, to all those things that they have. Do you know that the, bad, the, the unfortunate part of it is that people think, we think most of the time that they can control it. So when we're talking to them, when we see them, or when we want to intervene, we are unleashing our frustration on them. And a lot of times they are just helpless they are really helpless. Helpless in the sense that if it was that easy, they would not do it. Because what are the symptoms of alcoholism or alcohol disorder? We no longer use the term alcoholism or alcohol abuse or um, what they call it, addiction. Addiction is a no-no because we're trying to really bring down the stigma. When we keep calling it addiction, it, it, it kind of subconsciously, unconsciously impact whether the treatment-seeking behavior of people because of that addiction thing. So what we call it now in our DSM-5 is um, alcohol use disorder. And when we see it as alcohol use disorder, then we know. Remember what I said a diagnosis is. A diagnosis is not a label. A diagnosis is, is the map that shows us the road to the right treatment for a particular issue going on. That is what, that is what uh, a diagnosis is. It is not a label and it should not be used as such. So now if someone is having alcohol use disorder, then there's, there's a diagnosis and we need, it needs to be treated. And there are ways to treat it. But the problem is these people can't even help themselves. When it gets to a level that they have to finish a cartoon, when they have to take this and they need more, when they have to start mixing it to use it, Alcohol is taking control. They are no longer in control. And that is where all the criteria for alcohol misuse disorder, one of it, number one is you are trying to stop, but you cannot even stop. Another significant one is that despite all the things, all the negative impact, despite all the, the consequences, social consequences, um, um, social consequences, um, academic consequences, financial cons consequences, despite all those consequences, they cannot stop. So who would say something that would hurt them and would go into it? Alcoholics. Who would say something that would hurt them and they're so helpless against it? They walk right into it. Those who are dealing with alcohol use disorder. It brings me to the conclusion that I want to drive home today. And there are three things that I want us to take home. There are three things I want to take home. Let me see if I have any uh, comments. The three things I want us to take home is that if you keep thinking that someone that has alcohol use disorder is just being a spoiled brat or is just being a useless man or is just doing what they've always done in their family or is just being uh, um, uh, how, how will I call it? It's just been an irresponsible woman because it's not only men who have um, alcohol use disorder. Among our veterans and our, 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 and our military people, it's not only men. Women are dealing with this issue too. If you think that they're just doing that, then we're wrong. These people need help. It has to be treated. Alcohol use disorder cannot be wished away. And here's the thing, it cannot be wished away. They need help. And I'm telling you, I wish if you've ever, if you know somebody or you've ever 
been affected by alcohol use disorder before in a loved one, you would know the frustration that family members go through. But a lot of times we miss that part that they are helpless. So because we miss the part that they're helpless, we keep talking. We keep abusing them. We keep unleashing our frustration on them. I'm sorry. We keep saying, get it together. We keep saying, you're not the only one. And we're not giving them the help that they need. Like to really help them get treatment because it has to be treated. Alcohol use disorder has to be treated. And the second point is this. When alcohol use disorder is treated, it's not the only thing that should be treated. Studies have shown a lot of people, alcohol use disorder and traumatic post-traumatic stress disorder, they kind of go like five and six. There's something somebody is masking or there's something somebody is going through that they're not talking about. There's an issue that is unresolved that made them let go of their control and embrace the alcohol use. And now they can't help it. So in that instance, and when this is happening, we really, they really need to know that we're not only treating alcohol use disorder, we have to treat it with the traumatic event that might be the underlying uh, cause or risk factor. So we have to treat both together. We have to treat alcohol use disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder together. But which one do we treat first? We go for the alcohol use disorder first. Then we start uncovering what happened. And that is why even though medication can help, or maybe we have medications that we prescribe, I don't want to say names. We have medications that we prescribe, but it has to go hand in hand with therapy. And this leads me to the third part. When we now know that we need to help them seek treatment because they can't wish it away or they are out of, they cannot control it. The treatment is not just for alcohol disorder. Now, the last step is that the goal is not just to have them sober. The goal is not sobriety. The goal should be recovery. Because what if they're sober on alcohol, but the problem or the issue is still there, they can easily move to another substance to deal with that thing. They can easily slide back. They can easily relapse at some point. And that is why recovery should be the goal. And with recovery, guess what? It is not only that person that needs recovery. So when we're treating this thing, it's like the whole family has to be treated. The whole family unit has to be treated because the children have been hurt so many times. The wife has been heartbroken so many times. The parents have been, they've gone bankrupt because of this issue. They have sleepless nights because of this child or this or this person in the family that is having trouble. There's tussle everywhere. There are siblings not in agreement. There are people staying away. There's isolation. There's social isolation in the family. There's disruption. So if we're going for sobriety, we're wrong. Because it is only that person that can be sober. You can be sober for a, a, a sibling that has alcohol issue. I can't be sober for anybody that has alcohol issue in my family. That person has to be sober. But guess what? They will be the only one that would also deal with the relapse, the possibility of relapse, all the risk. Everywhere they go, they're the only one doing it. But when we focus on recovery, recovery is like that. It's, recovery is the, is the package, is the full package that treats everyone involved. The father, the mother, the wife, the children. Everybody's, everybody's hand, they have their hand on deck and they're working on how can we help? What can we do? What should we put in place? When do we help this person with caution? How do I express what I'm going through? Let's resolve this hurt that I have. Then everybody is working together for recovery. So a quick recap for everyone here. And I thank everyone. If you're still watching, will you just say hello? I can see some people watching me. If you're still watching, can you just say, I am still here. 
Tell me if you agree with me. Tell me what you think family members can do. Type it in and let's just let's let's interact. This 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 is a burden. This is a this is a a, a public health issue because I've seen. Thank you, Dr. Root. Thank you, Dr. Root, for for staying on. The, last year, uh, my brother was telling me they just went home and they said, "Oh." They're going for a funeral of a maybe 30-year-old man or something. What happened? A drunk driver just hit him. This man just had a just had a child, just had a baby. It was a terrible news that went around town here. That's what happened when we don't address this alcohol issue. And how many how many people in the military with their access to gun when they are angry, when they are under the influence of, of alcohol, how many people can die on the road? When under the influence of alcohol, how many accidental shootings can we have? When they're under the influence of alcohol, how many domestic violence cases are we having? When they're under the influence of alcohol, how many children do we have going through traumatic, living in a traumatic environment right now that will go ahead in the future to have problem relating with people to have problem trusting to have problem establishing relationship and they would also want to keep masking their own childhood issues so thank you all for staying dr Ruth, yes you said here support 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 you are right support 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 and that support starts from the first point which is understanding that someone dealing with alcohol use disorder cannot really help themselves sometimes we have to really make them do what they don't want to do like go into treatment and this is one of the reasons why we need to work on really battling stigma because people need to get treated and anybody that is seeking help or any family that is supporting their loved one to seek help should not be shamed for doing what they're doing. Oh, he's in recovery. Oh, can you hear that he's gone for um he's gone to for um, addiction treatment? Oh, did you hear this? Oh, did you hear that? Oh, they're asking. Oh, where is he now? So what are you doing in a malicious way? We cannot afford stigma. Because the stigma won't let me take my own sibling for treatment. Stigma won't let somebody take their husband for treatment. Stigma would let somebody struggle with their wife's alcohol issues all day and their wife, their children have been neglected because of the negative, negative image that we're given treatment seeking. It is unfair on all of us. I'll say the three things we have to do again. DJ Aziz, you agree? Yes. Here are the three things. Someone dealing with alcohol use disorder cannot help him or herself. They need treatment. Alcohol use disorder cannot be wished away. They need to go in for treatment. Part of the things that comes with alcohol use disorder, they have withdrawal. At the time that they're having withdrawal and they're shaking and they're going into this, having seizures, all at the, that is one of the things that, that holds them back, one of the things that holds them back the most. That feeling of, oh my goodness, what I can literally die. They feel like they go, they will be sweating profusely. So the nurses here, if you've taken care of somebody that is going through withdrawal before, you know how they have to have their banana bag. They have to have all these things where we put all that they will possibly need. It is a terrifying experience if they have to if they have to go through the process this is not something that can be done at home instead of going through that traumatic experience of wanting to stop on their own they would rather get their other glass and drink it and not go through that pain going back to dr root's work support 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 they need support they can't do it alone they need treatment stop abusing them stop shaming them stop comparing them with other veterans that are doing better stop comparing them to civilians that have not seen anything but are coping well stop saying are you the only one that would go to war are you the only one that will have ptsd are you the only one that i ever experienced trauma stop saying that they need help they need to be treated the second thing is that with treatment the second thing is that with treatment, they are not just going to treat the alcohol disorder. 
the trauma, underlying trauma has to be treated. So it is a dual diagnosis in most cases, and it has to be treated as such. And the third thing is this, focus should not be on sobriety. Sobriety would not help. Sobriety can be temporary. With sobriety, at some point, there can be relapse, there can be exposure at their lowest point. Because remember, after the treatment, it doesn't mean like that life is still not there. It doesn't mean that triggers would go away. It doesn't mean that they would not go into, it doesn't mean that they wouldn't come into my house and maybe see these bottles. But I don't know what is going on. Life is still there. So sobriety is not enough. Recovery is what we need. And with recovery, one major difference is that with recovery, it is not just that person that is going through the process. It is not just that person that is going through the treatment. It is a community. Everybody that are being directly impacted by that disorder had to be involved in it. So alcohol use disorder, unfortunately, we have it higher among our veterans, among our military people than among civilians. But if you if you would just take a moment to think of what they've gone through, what they've seen, where they've been, what they've had to mask, what they've had to do, what they have to keep to themselves, what they're not saying, you would know that it is not easy. And if any one of them is going through any disorder, it is not something that we take lightly. Let's help them. And with traumatic issues, we have alcohol being their first friend a lot of times. And if it's not alcohol, it can be something else. The point is it needs to be treated. So help your loved one, a friend, anybody that you know, please help them seek help, support them. Tell them you will be okay. My patient that I saw recently, you know, is an elderly person, an elderly man, even with me, I could see, and I told him, sir, I had to say, thank you for your service. He rolled his eyes and I could see the pain. I could just see it and say, we're gonna walk through this together. I know that we need the team on board to help him, but I was happy when he told me that. My wife said, let's just give this a try again. You know what that means? It means that seeing me or is not the first treatment that he's having. This is not the first time he's seeking help. It is not the first time, but things are not the same again. I'm, I'm looking forward to meeting his wife. I probably will be seeing his wife and me, his, his children. His children are actually like my age mates. I'm looking forward to seeing them and we're going to do it together. So if you are that wife or you are that friend or you are that neighbor that can just tell your neighbor that, you know what, let's seek help. It can just be as simple as that. Just knowing that you're not judging them, just knowing that you're there for them, it, it will go a long way. Because the trouble that alcohol is causing in the families and in the lives of those that they're dealing with the disorder is unexplainable. So you join me today and I'm very, very happy. So please, I mean, this, is there if you would share it if anybody would need help please if you have resources that people can go to because there are people listening to me now in different countries not everybody is in the united states even in the united states not everybody have access to care the same way whatever we need to do let us help let us help them seek help if you are a leader in the military in the force whatever arm of forces that you are i think and I'm, I'm employing you to please look more into how can the treatment of our veterans be efficient. I somebody saying happy Sabbath D1, happy Sabbath. I'm sorry, I can't see your name, but happy Sabbath. And making me remember my backup days now. Um, yes, yeah, so they need help. You're a leader in the military. You're a leader in, the, in your neighborhood for those who are veterans who are now leaving with, with us, you're a leader at work and you do employ veterans, you are somewhere in a leadership position and you can make decisions and you are part of the voices that contributes to policies in your workplace or in your business, 
or in everywhere that you anywhere that you are even in churches let us let us just be intentional about supporting our military people about giving them the support tell them it's okay let's not trivialize what they're going through i'm glad you joined me today and i'll see you next week you want to ask me a question you want to make contribution please go ahead and do it i'm glad to hear that i'm i'm, I'm share your success story and if you are a military person here a veteran or a family member and you've been able to overcome this monster this monster called alcohol use disorder will you share your beautiful story with us your journey it might be painful but guess what it might just help one family it might save one life that will be dead in an accident by uh, somebody with dui maybe you share your journey of, and your success story with us and in my help. It really will help. DJ Aziz says, thank you as always. I thank you as always too. You are, you, you are one of those who I look forward to. Yeah, I'm going live today and I do it because um, I know you appreciate this. So everyone, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to be throwing this away. <laughs> but thank you for listening. We can actually help. Alcohol use, Alcohol use disorder is a monster. Let's beat it. And I'll end on this note again. My mental health matters. What about yours?